Hey, this is Eric Dureck and welcome to this edition of Med Health Fit, the TV show that integrates wellness and healthcare. And tonight, I have a two-part series. The first part is going to be on blood labs. And blood laboratory analysis is a fascinating part of medicine. It's a fascinating part of health promotion. And it's one of those things that people take for granted uh, when they are at the uh, uh, school or whether they're working or whatever. And, and it's only until they get into the doctor's office that they really find that they're having an issue. So tonight, I want to talk in a two-part series. The first part is going to be on, on the whole issues that, that are related to blood labs. And uh, what most people don't really understand is that blood labs are most of what makes up a physician's practice. And what most people don't know is most of the diagnoses that doctors make are related to blood labs. So let's really start here in looking at how blood labs have an effect, not just in medicine, we already know that, but in health and wellness. So let's take a look. So I think that people who work in health promotion, whether they're health coaches or personal trainers or dietitians, are going to have much more of a, an effect on blood labs in the coming years because of a few things that are happening with technology. Um, and they will actually be competing with other allied health professionals like doctors and nurses who are the ones who routinely either prescribe blood labs or who are the ones who draw them and, and sort of look at the results. So things are changing very rapidly in the blood lab technology field uh, just in the last five years. Um, so if you want to get a blood lab test and you don't want to go through your doctor, it's now possible to do that. But it really kind of begs the question, well, if I do this online program, will I save money? Will it be easier than, than you know, having me uh, go to my doctor's office? You know, you know what's, what are all the aspects of it? There's a lot of questions that people have now in terms of this whole new world of technology related to getting your blood labs done online. Now, that doesn't mean you're going to get your blood drawn online. You still have to go to your local uh, blood lab. But all of the paperwork, all of the uh, medical referrals, all of the um, process of going through the blood labs are going to be done with your online uh, coach, probably who's a doctor. Um, so the other thing about having this blood lab data in terms of the health promotion world is going to be, I think, fantastic, is they're going to have a lot of really interesting data on people who have either medical conditions or pre-medical conditions to see the effects of the actual exercise program that they are providing for them. So let's take a look here. Uh, the purpose of the lecture that we're going to do here, this the first part of our two-part series, we're going to look at understanding how we use blood labs both in diagnostics and measurement. Uh, we want to know the process of using blood labs. In other words, this is this little bit different than what you're usually used to in going to your doctor's office or going to a hospital. The other one here is we want to talk about kind of a scope of practice. You know, me as a health promotion expert, uh, how much leeway do I have in terms of referring my client base to a, an internet-based uh, you know, blood lab company? You know, what, what are the legal and, and sort of professional ramifications of me doing that? Uh, the other thing is we want to make sure that we can get blood labs for specific types of conditions. So if someone has a, a, a condition like diabetes, we want to make sure that the blood labs that we are, are requesting with that client are actually specific to helping their diabetes condition. And the last one is just looking at this thing as part of the business of developing and, and giving health promotion programs to people. Because if blood labs are so important in medicine, routine medical care, then the part of the purpose of this lecture is to give you information to say that these blood labs are probably very important for you in your work as a health education specialist, personal trainer, dietitian, nutritionist, etc. There's a lot of information here. So I've got a question here for the audience based on this slide and it's what are all these devices have in common? You've got a home cholesterol test, you've got a home glucose test, 
you've got a home oximetry test that's on the finger, you've got a home blood pressure test and, and on, the, 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 uh, on the right hand side of the screen there, you actually have a lactate uh, test as well. So you have all of these types of tests that people can do. And what's interesting, thing, interesting about these is you can get all of these products on Amazon.com. You don't have to get a referral from your doctor to get most of these things. Um, you can just buy them on the internet. And I think that this has opened up a whole new world of not just consumerism, but self-care in people who want to know certain types of things. So with the diabetes monitor, you have the ability to look at your uh, blood sugars a number of times a day, but the finger that's got the oximetry unit and also blood uh, pressure unit on there is that if you're an athlete and you want to know what your lactic acid levels are with, with high intensity training or you want to look at your uh, oximetry levels, you have the ability to clip something onto your finger or to take a very small blood test and get those numbers in real time. And we've seen a number of professional athletes like marathon runners and professional cyclists who use lactate training as part of their intense uh, workouts. So these things all have a, a, they're part of the big plan here in terms of, of self-care and, and performance that you don't necessarily now need to have a doctor's prescription to get some of these things. So let's talk a little bit about blood labs. They've actually been involved with medical care for you know almost a hundred years now and uh, as I said at the beginning of the show about 80 percent or more of a doctor's medical diagnosis is based on the results of blood labs. So doctors hold a blood lab test in very high esteem in terms of what they do with their day-to-day -day practice. Um, blood labs are measured during exercise and sports participation. Uh, one example would be uh, training pre and post. You're going to do a heavy workout. You test your blood lactate and you test your blood sugars beforehand and then at the end of that hard workout you can do another test and see what the effect was of the meal that you ate and the type of exercise that you're doing on those blood values. And blood labs change over time. As a matter of fact there are some uh, blood things like blood sugars that can, that can change within minutes. So having the ability to use technology to measure these blood labs is very important. And having the ability as a consumer to go get a blood draw at a lab at your convenience is also becoming very, very important in terms of the self-care concept. Well, I, I want to point out some of the controversies in, uh, in blood labs. And this is a, um, this is a study from a, uh, a medical journal from a couple years back. And it says, you know, why do we need to have, you know, these blood labs and, and really have a good standard control? The, uh, the title of this is The Measurement of Glycosylated Hemoglobin in Diabetes Trials and should blood samples be tested locally or, central, or sent to a central lab. So even in 2016, in a big diabetes clinical trial, the authors were still concerned that having the blood go to different laboratories produced very different types of results and they wanted to make sure that they were standardized. So this is a big issue in bloods is that if your blood sugar says that it's 85 milligrams per deciliter of blood, it should be 85 milligrams and it shouldn't vary very much between this laboratory test or that laboratory test. It should be what it is. So I want to take a look at some definitions of the blood types that doctors and allied health care people are looking at. The first one is red blood cells and red blood cells carry oxygen to the cells. That's really the main purpose of red cells. White blood cells are the, the portions in the blood that help fight infections uh, and viruses that are you know, in the body and we can measure the effect they're having by the rise or the fall in white blood cell count. The third one is plasma and if you ever spin blood or see blood in, in a vial the bottom part is usually red and the top part is sort of a kind of a milky light 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 you know beige brown color and that's the that's the the plasma that contains the proteins it transports substances like blood sugars and nutrients uh, within the blood uh, to the tissues that they're working with and within that plasma contains uh, platelets and these are the little sticky sub uh, 
substances that are actually called the clotting factors. So if you ever cut your finger, these platelets will actually uh, get around the cut from the inside and they'll sort of stack up on one another and they'll help stop the bleeding over time. The next one is fibrinogen, which helps with co the coagulation process and actually helps reduce blood clots in the system that may happen uh, based on trauma or something else. And lastly, we have gamma globulins, and they produce the antibodies, and these are very important to, in terms of fighting infection and helping keep the immune system uh, in a good spot. Well, I told you that it's very important that when you are looking at bloods that you have consistency. And um, <clears throat> I want to go to this slide right here, and I want to introduce you to the, the woman on the right uh, side here. Um, her name is Elizabeth Holmes, and she was the CEO of a company called Theranos for the past five years. And she said that, that she could take a finger stick of blood, and she could measure hundreds of different blood components. And she got a lot of investors, and she had a company up in the Bay Area in California, and she grew a company, I don't know, in 10 years from a small laboratory to a $40 billion industry. But her technology was not solid. Her blood results were not standardized time after time after time. And when some of the regulatory agencies started to come after her, she said, well, you know, this is proprietary. We can't really tell you what's going on. But that didn't fly after a few years. So back in 2016, um, the, um, uh, S, the, 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 the Securities and Exchange Commission came after her and they basically essentially closed down her company and tried to give as much money back to investors as possible because she was not exactly um, prudent in the, the, the type of information that she was giving not just to investors but to the general public in terms of this technology that I have is standardized and it's going to be accurate time after time after time. There are a number of other companies that are online that use traditional venous blood draws and they use some of the traditional labs. They just have contracts with them. And what they're really doing is they're selling you the service of convenience to get a lab when you want and convenience of talking with a physician or a healthcare person once you get those lab results within 24 to 48 hours. And that's really the big change that, that we see. Uh, people who get a blood lab with their doctors usually have to wait till their next doctor's visit two or three days later or maybe a week later uh, so they can get the results of those bloods. And like I had mentioned earlier in the show, these, some of these blood labs change within minutes or hours. So if you could get certain types of bloods done on a regular basis, you really have some good information as to how that 10-pound weight loss affected your blood fats or how doing a regular exercise program affected your diabetes status from, from your bloods. So there's some really interesting information that's coming down, uh, coming down the pike. Okay, so let's look at who actually can, can do bloods. Now, according to the laws that govern uh, blood labs, usually a licensed physician is the one who would be able to tell you, oh, you know, your blood sugars are high, you have diabetes. But other people can look at your cholesterol and your blood lipids and say, hey, let's see if these things can't change over time. So in terms of scope of practice, um, you know, there are specific types of people who can diagnose, but, and then the blood labs have to be certified themselves through the clinical lab improvement amendments, which is what's called, they're called CLIA, and they have to make sure that their blood samples are consistent time after time. Um, they have to establish these quality, and only 12 states a few years ago require, required laboratories to actually be certified. So even though there are thousands of uh, blood labs across the United States, the quality of their, uh, their measurements in certain cases has been suspect. So this is another reason why it's important to work with a blood lab company that works with a, a laboratory like here in California, we've got Pacific Diagnostic Labs. It's a big, big company, and they have labs all over the country. They adhere to a very, very strict standard. So if you're working with a company online, you might want to make sure that the lab that they're working with has got their standards ready to go. Um, so anyway, um, there are some legal issues about blood labs, and uh, there really aren't any, any um, 
uh, laws here that regulate or prohibit personal trainers or dietitians from referring their clients to get blood labs. As I mentioned, they just can't diagnose any types of diseases from the results of those labs. So we want to define what a patient-centered lab is, and that's really one that does direct business with the consumer. So the patient either picks up the phone or they log on to the website and they have the interaction with the staff from that blood uh, lab company online. So even though the, the, let's say the personal trainer refers their client to get a lab, they're not actually doing all of the work. The patient, the client is, is logging on, they're, they're calling up the health coach and they're, they're doing all of the business uh, aspects about being a part of that lab and then they'll go downtown to the, to the local blood lab and they'll get the actual blood draw the day afterwards. So all of the, you know, they paid the paperwork, they've got their assessment forms done, and then it's time for them to go do that. So the rise of companies that cater to the consumer, uh, one of my favorites uh, is called Step One Health. And we actually had um, uh, the owner of Step One Health on the show here last year, Dr. Craig Brandman, and they have a tremendous company that does cardiovascular labs, hormone labs, um, very specific immune system panels, anti-aging. They have all kinds of things at steponehealth.com. I think that they're one of the best all-around lab companies in the United States. But uh, there's also another one called LabCorp, and they do, for the most part, their, their area is the home health market. So people who need to have blood draws can have someone come to their house as part of this uh, uh, process and get a blood lab. And also, you know, you can do paternity testing, genetics testing. Some of these have very specific things that they do versus other labs. Um, AnyLabTest.com is really one that does some wellness components like cardiovascular testing, and they also do just, you know, straight out cholesterol, um, you know, uh, other types of risk factors that are, that are pretty much in the wellness standpoint. And then directlabs.com and personallabs.com, all of these things are trying to really cater to the healthy lifestyle market. So there's plenty of laboratories out there or online companies that will cater to a person who really wants to have blood labs and they want to have control as a consumer. So what type of blood panels would you use in the wellness area? Well, I've, I've got different kinds here and the ones that I've highlighted in blue are the ones that I think that we would want to use the most in terms of health promotion. And one of them would be uh, uh, blood labs that, are, that have to do with cancer. And this would be immune system panels and like CA125 readings, et cetera, that, you know, hey, I, you know, my prostate specific antigen, I want to see what these blood levels are. So I want to see what my risk is for cancer. The second one is gastrointestinal. So we might want to look at immune system panels or antibodies that are specific to the gut that, again, may have a problem down the road. And we can see this if we're doing a regular labs. Uh, uh, ones with anemia, anemia, which is red blood cells, asthma, arthritis, cardiovascular risk profile. I have down here uh, sports medicine, which could be a number of different profiles. Diabetes, and lastly, one of the big ones is anti-aging, and there's all kinds of blood labs, hormones that people look for in terms of uh, anti-aging. So they may, they may get a blood lab and they may get on an anti-aging formula of vitamins and herbs or whatever and then test three to six months later. So let's look at some blood values. Now I talked about red blood cells. What I'm going to talk about here is that it's the, the actual part of the red blood cell is the hemoglobin which carries the oxygen into the cells that you breathe in from your lungs. Low levels are usually uh, indicative of having anemia which means you might have to have some sort of iron, ferrous iron supplementation over time, and then we will retest to see how those hemoglobin levels have changed. The next one is white blood cells, and there's actually five different types. We've got basophils, which release histamines. That's sort of a, a swelling reaction if you like get stung by a bee or something. Eosinophils, which are uh, they eat antigen invaders via their own type of antibodies. The next one is lymphocytes, which kill viruses. Everyone's probably heard of T lymphocytes or B lymphocytes, uh, which have to do with you know, thymus and, and cancer risk and all that. And then the next one is monocytes, which eats bac bacteria and viruses. And the last one is neutrophils, which eat bacteria and germs. So all of these elements of the blood have very specific functions which help guard against disease, but may actually help if you come down with the disease as well. 
So we can just see by looking at red and white blood cells, it's pretty, it gets pretty complicated. So speaking of complicated, I want to tell you how they actually measure this because uh, when I had mentioned earlier about uh, diabetes, we know that they have certain blood values like milli milligrams per deciliter. Well, you can actually look at cubic centimeters, you can look at milligrams per deciliter, you can look at international units, which some people see in their, on their vitamin tablets, you can look at milliequivalents per milliliter, you can look at millimoles per liter, and each one of these things gets a little bit smaller and a little bit smaller until you get nanograms uh, per milliliter, which is very, very small, and actually you have picograms, which is one trillionth of a gram, and I am really interested to know <laughs> how anybody can actually see something in the blood that's that small because we're really looking at something that's even smaller, I think, than homeopathic medicine where you're looking at something so very, very small. Millimoles and nanograms, I've actually seen those measurements uh, at, at certain times with certain types of, uh, of blood labs. All right, well, let's look at a couple chem panels here. Let's look at something now for metabolic. Uh, albumin, which is a protein enzyme. That's indicative of some problem with the liver. Um, and uh, alkaline phosphatase, which looks at liver and bone enzymes. And if you get a, a reading that's about over 145 milligrams, you may have actually uh, uh, some kind of a bone disease or a precursor to a bone disease. The next one is bilirubin. And a lot of people who get blood tests see that they might have a problem with their bilirubin numbers, but they really have never kind of understood what bilirubin is. And it's indicative of liver, kidney, and bile duct function. So your bile duct helps with the initial digestion process. So if you have very high levels of bilirubin, you may actually have you know, high levels of this type of bile function uh, in the system. So anything over 2.0 may indicate that you might have something like anemia. Uh, BUN is, is called blood, blood urea nitrogen, which is looking at the amount of nitrogen gas within the blood, which is also very important. And uh, this could also in, be indicative of both problems with kidney function, which may have something to do with your protein metabolism. So looking at uh, nitrogen levels is very uh, uh, a good way of looking to see how well you're metabolizing protein. And uh, a lot of physiology people call that net nitrogen utilization. So if your net nitrogen utilization is very high, 90, 95, 98 percent, you don't have a lot of it in the system. But if your nitrogen utilization is only 40 to 50 percent, you have a lot more nitrogen in the system and it's causing problems with both kidney function and it's having a little bit of trouble getting rid of some of the protein that you have in the, in the body. The last one is calcium. Now everyone says, oh, you've got to you know, eat your greens for getting more calcium in the body, but a lot of people don't understand that it is a thyroid uh, vitamin. It's a parathyroid vitamin. It helps with um, certain types of cancers. It's cancer prevention. And also, if you are deficient in vitamin D, you may also have a problem with calcium. So we want to keep it between 9 and 10 uh, milligrams per deciliter in the blood to make sure that we keep a good level in that. So uh, our first metabolic condition, which is, uses very important bloods, is diabetes. And the number one thing that we look for is the A1C or the glycosylated hemoglobin. And the glycosylated hemoglobin is just the percentage of sugar that attaches to the hemoglobin that gets transported around the system. And we're really looking for about 7% saturation on that red cell or less. If we get too much uh, saturation, 10%, 12 15 even 20% A1C, we know we've got some severe diabetes problems. The other one we look for is fasting blood sugars. And anybody who goes to a lab to get a, a blood test, their doctor's going to say, I want you to fast the night before. Well, one of the reasons why they tell you to fast the night before is one of the most important fasting tests is glucose. And that glucose for most people should be under 95 milligrams per deciliter. That's basically saying that, hey, your body's using it. Uh, you don't have any overt diabetes symptoms right now. And for the most part, your, your glucose metabolism is on the right track. Um, in diabetes, we also look at cardiovascular risk profiles like lipids. We also look at inflammatory markers, and we're going to be talking about that over the next few slides, both in this segment and in the next segment. 
because inflammatory markers are really becoming one of the big areas in blood labs that people should know about in terms of the foods they eat, cutting out certain types of foods, adding certain foods into the diet is all related to uh, the uh, inflammatory markers. So we also have pre and post uh, blood sugars which you can test yourself using a home monitor and that's also dependent on the type of food you eat and the intensity of exercise that you're doing. So our next slide, and I'm going to end this segment on this slide here, is about cancers. And cancers look at a number of different blood labs, but some of the most important is the CBC, which is called a complete blood count. And that really looks at a number of different uh, uh, representations within the blood, whether it's cardiovascular, immune system, etc. And it's all done in one lab test. So you may go to a lab and they may take three, four, five, even six vials of blood during a CBC because they're looking for quite a bit of things. So one of them is blood proteins. They want to look to see if your blood proteins are elevated in cancer status. The other one is your immune system panel. And one of the big ones that I like to look for in my own uh, immune system is how well my NK or my natural killer cells are doing. So if I have a normal range of NK cells, I know that I'm you know, kind of fighting off small tumors and other types of invading uh, microbes at a pretty good level. If your NK cell level is low, you may have a problem. But if your NK cell, uh, cell level is very high, you may also have, uh, you know, a tumor that's growing in the body. Some of the other immune panel markers are macrophages, white cells, which we've spoken about, lymphocytes and monocytes, and all of these things together do the job of fighting off certain types of bacteria, infections, and in, in, in the case of cancer, uh, a, a, a regular one of your own cells that's actually started dividing uh, very rapidly. So the body has a way of looking at that and actually getting some cells to surround it and to try to get it from expanding uh, until it gets out of control. Well, the other thing here are tumor markers. So if you have a certain amount of, you know, some sort of cancer thing happening in the body, you can look at a CA125, which is for ovarian cancer. A PSA is for prostate cancer. Uh, an HCG is for testicular and ovarian cancer. And uh, lastly, we have a, a tumor necrosis factor, which will look at a number of different things in terms of that. So you can do blood tests, you can also do urine tests, but for the most part, people who are, are interested in learning about cancer will look at those blood labs. So this is, this is the first part of our two-part series, and I, there's a lot of stuff we have to go for. Uh, there's a lot of information that we have to detail, but I appreciate you spending the time and learning a little bit about blood labs. So for Medical Health and Fitness, this is Eric Durack, and tune in for our second uh, session on blood labs here at MedHealth Fit. Thanks for watching.